So on this episode, you'll see me back on the Rolls-Royce Corniche to complete the upgrade on that old AC system and see the interior come back together as I replace that old cracked wood with its newly refurbished set. So I'm off to see a guy called Roy Cameron. Um, he has a company called Cameron and Lunt, which I remember as a kid, it used to be in the Lark Lane area of Liverpool. And there was always tons of like uh, Rolls Royce shadows, and corniches, S1s, S2s, sitting outside the garage. Uh, they then moved premises to Egworth Road. And then just recently, I think they've moved up the road to Garston. Uh, but they're still into Rolls Royces. I'm not sure whether they're a mark specialist, but I know this is one of the few guys who's properly served his time with Rolls Royce as a mechanic. So it'll just be interesting to go and visit him, maybe pick up a few tips, uh, see what he's got on the go at the moment, maybe see his little collection of cars if he's got one, and might get a couple of stories into the bargain. And speaking of stories, I heard Roy was actually commissioned to work on Her Majesty the Queen's Rolls Royce a few years ago. And I also remember in the late 90s, Donald Sutherland's 1965 Cloud 3 permanently parked up at his old premises for the actor's personal use while in the UK. And as I'm sure you all know by now, I'm an absolute sponge for information. Never be too proud or embarrassed to seek advice. I'll listen to anyone willing to share or teach me the tricks of the trade. Well, come on. Isn't that what this whole classic car community is all about? Yeah, so Roy, I've up upgraded or I'm in the process of upgrading my aircon system. Uh, I got this upgrade kit from Intracar, so I've fitted a new compressor and a new dryer. But I'm just about to fit all the electrical components. And I mean, I'm not really that big on electrics, but I'm all right replacing life for life. But this looks like a little bit involved. I don't know, because you do it day in, day out. I come and pick your brains and uh, talk to you about your cars as well. Okay. Uh, so yeah, let's, can, we, can we go through this, I mean... So basically, that's, that's your new expansion valve. That goes under there so, somewhere, so it's hidden to, away. need to fit that there, that's hidden away under there. Yeah. So this senses the temperature, so yeah. if the temperature on that suction pipe is getting too high, yeah. then it'll cut the feed to the compressor, saving any damage. If the pressure went up it too would, high, there'd it, be no cut it off, would, yeah. It would blow your compressor. Yeah. This is more in line with the Shadow 2. And then you fit. And that's what's this like? Dum dum? Is this like a so, seal? Is it? So, so you you'll clamp this sensing pipe to your suction pipe. Yeah. With the clamp supplied in the kit. Yeah. There, there it is. Yeah. So you'll clamp that on a nice clean pipe. You'll Got plug you. that into there. Into there. And then your earth will either go onto that bolt, or you could put a bolt in there. And then you'll wire the green end to one side of this relay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> You'll probably have to use a jumper wire. Right, I think it says that in the uh, destructions. Yeah, you'll have to get a jumper wire from there to the other. And it's probably best just wrapping this up with some um, plastic. Yeah, just uh, to insulate protect it. Protective. Yeah. Make it look smarter. You can get the corrugated um, plastic uh, yeah. wrapping. Uh, also gives you a bit of a heat, thermal heat barrier as well in case it not touches any of the hot metal of the engine. Brilliant. I mean, it looks kind of complicated, but when you yeah, in those terms, it's actually quite yeah. simple, isn't no, it? No, it is quite simple. So with that done, let's have a little sneak preview of his personal stash of classic cars. What's the story behind this? It's Cooper, isn't it? So this is a genuine Cooper S, uh, built in Sweden, uh, raced extensively in the European Touring what? Car Challenge. Why was it built in Sweden? Well, it's a Swedish team, professional racing team. They built it. Um, I've got quite a few uh, pictures of it in various circuits all over Europe, being raced. And that's his son, is it, yeah? That's, this is my son. And uh, so we raced this at the last year's Alton Park Gold Cup and the Jack Sears Trophy. So Two driver race, so it was ticking a bucket list for me. What happened there, Roy? Um, Bit of a bash, uh, that, isn't it? An Austin A40 uh, pulled out into the, uh, the braking zone in front of me. And he was going faster, so unfortunately he couldn't avoid the collision. It would have been worse, couldn't it? That's thick steel, um, that, isn't it? Yeah, it hasn't done any uh, structural damage. But we're all the minis, all the Coopers like steel like this. Yeah, yeah. Didn't um, realise they were so robust. So this is um, built by the reputable Swift Tune company. It's the best engines you can get. Produces about 130 brake horsepower. 
Oh. So in a light uh, 600 kilogram shell, it's, it's pretty rapid. Um, and of course you've got a few Bentleys and Rolls Royces, which is your thing really, isn't it? Yeah, well that's... Um, I mean, tell the viewers about how you started. You did your training. So I started at um, W. Watson and Company, who were the, the main agents for Liverpool at the time. Yeah. Um, so what was this in the 60s? So this was in 1969. Yeah. And that was at a time Just when... Before decimalisation, it was still. I mean, it's affluent in Liverpool now, but yeah. for a time, especially so, throughout the 80s, it was yeah. pretty skimp, wasn't it? Yeah. There but was, in the, um, you know, right through the 30s, the 40s, 50s, 60s, there was a lot of yeah. money in Liverpool, yeah, wasn't I've it? Not... What a wonderful car. <clears throat> it's come from the Liverpool dealer, W. Watson and Company. So wow. the hairs on the back of my neck just went up. When you served your apprenticeship there, did you not recognise the car? Did it look familiar? Or? No, it was a little, this, this is a 1952 car, so it was a little bit before my time. No, but it might have come in for service. Um, and that, you know. Not that I can remember. That's where I started my apprenticeship. What a nice tie-in. Yeah. I even came with workshop manuals from W. Watson & Company. It's, it's a keeper, this, isn't it? So they're just so interesting, these cars. Uh, they've just got oodles of character. Yeah. Uh, and... You know, they're quite eminently usable on the modern roads. That they're, they're pretty powerful. Uh, and that stuff like that's just solid that, gold. Yeah. Isn't it great? Yeah. yeah, it's just solid gold. So it's as original as you're going to get this, really, isn't it? It is, yeah. It needs some detailing on the engine. Cars need to um, be used, don't they? My big plan for this is to do um, a tour of Scotland, just staying in nice hotels and just yeah. ambling around Scotland, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I know that's, that's kind of what I love to do, you know, yeah. if I had time. You, you can put an, the old-fashioned trunk on there. And, uh, oh, the old and picnic basket, you yeah. mean? So it's designed to have the boot down. I was over in the States a few weeks ago, Roy, and we were looking at 300 SLs, you know, like the Roadsters mm -hmm. and the Gullwings, and they had, like, their own personal luggage made, you know, at the factory when the people yeah. ordered the car. Yeah. And a lot of them still had the luggage with them. A blind that comes up and uh, gives you a bit of privacy in the, in the back window there as well. Yeah. What a wonderful car. Um, picnic trays in the back. I wonder, so who bought this new? Did you have, you've um, got all the paperwork it, with it, yeah? yeah? It was a um, cafe owner in Rill. Uh, a cafe it. owner in Rill? I thought Rill. you were going to say, a guy lived in a stately hall no, in Earl had, of um, Suffolk or he whatever. Few, he had a few cafes around the area, land of no um, Rill. So not yeah, what you'd expect, not, though, is it? Yeah. A cafe I'm, owner to drive around yeah. in it. So there is a fair bit Bentley. of history in there. that probably worked very hard to, uh, to save up for it. Yeah. I was speaking to uh, the owners of Gorsworth Hall a few years ago. A very eccentric, lovely family. The lady of the house was, was talking about back in, you know, the 40s and when Liverpool, you know, like the Adelphi Hotel, there was a lot of money about, you know. Yeah, yeah very, and, uh, very glamorous time. The story she had to tell about Bentleys and Rolls Royces and, mm -hmm. you know, all meeting up at the Adelphi for, for lunch or cream tea, whatever. Yeah. And you think, what, Liverpool? Yeah. But it was a very well, affluent place. It was. Still is. You, you only have to look at the architecture of the buildings around yeah. Liverpool. Yeah, it's yeah, stunning, it isn't it? Been, right? But you forget yeah. about those things, and then suddenly you yeah. see a car like this, and it's a little reminder yeah. of the well, way things so, used to be. So many bad things happened to Liverpool over the over the years. So after that nice little interlude, Roy's kindly agreed to get on the wiring with me just to make sure everything's present and correct. There's the pressure switch. A special heat sheet is fitted along the wires. And just like the brakes, the AC system is another area not to be messed about with. Correct procedures have to be followed to enable safe operation. And this is probably one of those areas best left to the experts. So, safely back home, I finally get around to fitting that temperature sensor. I make sure the pipe is clean, so there's a good contact. It's fastened up with a Jubilee clip. I connect up the wires, and then once everything's firmly in place, I finish it off and cover it in the protective sealant. This stops any residual heat in the engine bay from giving the sensor a false reading, 
and consequently cutting out the compressor. So now all that's left to take this one off the list is to go to reputable recommended AC specialist. So I'm off to see Matty Rhodes at Rhodes Auto Care, who uses a state-of-the-art machine which safely purges the old system, calculates and replenishes using the correct ratio of pack oil and gas, and also injects the ultraviolet oil to suss out any system leaks. And with everything holding its charge, icy cold, with no leaks, success. Now onto those torque arm mounts. These fit to the rear subframe sway bar. You see, now I've sorted out those rattles in the rear windows, I'm gonna work my way over to the rear suspension. So if there's any play or rattles there, I can also eliminate them too. So I'm gonna start with these rear torque arm mounts. And then in the next couple of episodes, I'll probably move on to the rear subframe mounts as well. Now, you may remember in a previous episode when I fitted the ride height kit, on Ian Tyrrell's advice, I decided to leave the rear anti-roll bar off. He'd worked with Roddy Harvey Bailey and between them decided it was marginally better to do so. But you know, personally, I can't really feel any difference or benefits. So now, the sway bar's undone. I've decided to refit it. So, back to those torque arm mounts. Now, refitment is a reversal of removal, but don't forget to refit the thick half washers and fit both mounts with the large side down. Now, when I removed these, I found an exhaust hang rubber and a couple of washers taken up the slack. So I've used the same measurement, but now using the correct spacers. And to finish off, obviously, torque up to the correct tolerance. A final tighten up of the anti-roll bar. And you can see this is actually a lot thicker than the normal anti-roll bar. This came along with the ride kit it previously fitted from Intracar. And with the messy jobs done, I think it's time to do something a little bit more satisfying. Let's go and pick that wood up, shall we? Phil Griffin is one of the most respected piano restorers in the country. Working as Steinway's go-to repairer for over 30 years, he can also regale stories from restoring Paul McCartney's beloved Gran, which he regularly uses on world tours, to Pink Floyd's Dave Gilmore's personal grand piano, which needed a new top lid after his young children dancing it continually while he played. And if you remember the way this wood was in the beginning, you can see just exactly where Phil gets his reputation from. 
This is absolutely flawless. This has turned out better than I imagined. I can't wait to fit it. And I always think this is a great opportunity before the wood's fitted back in to change every single bulb. Because you know the score there, guys. The whole dash has to come out just to change one bulb. So while it's out, just do the lot for peace of mind. And a quick test. Well, the coolant light's not working. Another job to add to the list. So, out came Technospray's colour bond, and I had to do the seats as well.
and for some reason the passenger door had refused to open from the outside again and on closer inspection the trigger had mysteriously snapped over to the wrong side of the catch. So after loosening the lock and an hour of persuasion with two large screwdrivers, job complete. Then when the panel's on to the all-important feed. Just get any leather conditioner, just lash it on, then a couple of hours later, buff it off with a microcloth. This way the leather stays nice and supple and protected. Refit all the newly painted trim and then with the door cappings, once the brand new felt is carefully glued on, just take your time refitting it all. This is probably one of the most pleasurable jobs. Just take your time and enjoy. So with a nice set of original mats to finish and the air can't blow on nice and cold. You know, this was a nice car to begin with. I know it's by no means perfect, but I'm sure you'll agree that after just a few days work and a bit of effort, just a few simple improvements, it's taken this car to another level. Thank you for watching this episode of Classic Obsession. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and see you all next time.